Hi, and welcome to Your Monitor International's podcast series, discussing global trends in industries, economies, and consumers. My name is Alexandre Leur, Research Manager in our London office, and I'm joined today by Veronika Kondusova, Per Brandberg, and Miles Agbar. This episode is the third in a series that explores how hybrid working has impacted several industries across Western Europe. It has become the norm and doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Our previous episode focused on the impact of hybrid working on the food industry. Today, we turn our attention to what it means for industries like consumer electronics and appliances, home and garden, toys and games, and tissue and hygiene. So Veronica, Per, Mars, thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. So Veronica, let's kick things off with you. You've been covering consumer appliances and electronics for the past two years. So what has hybrid working meant for these industries? Well, so the most immediate change was to do with consumers turning their homes into their workspace, as many of us here experienced. So what we saw happening across Western Europe was consumers looking for new laptops, monitors and headphones to start their permanent home office. Interestingly, we also saw a renaissance of products considered outdated prior to the pandemic, such as printers and desktops. The change was visible and actually still is, uh, also in terms of screen sizes and price points, with a general feeling that hybrid working is here to stay. And we can say that consumers were willing to invest in larger screens and high-end models of such products. That's interesting. So would you say that the impact was mainly an immediate one of purchases or are we seeing long-term demand? We are past the point to think about hybrid working and the demand it creates for appliances and electronics only as a pandemic-related fact. That being said, these industries now see challenges with components and rising prices in many parts of the manufacturing and distribution process. And at the same time, consumers face inflationary pressures on their budget. So there is a bit of a slowdown currently. But it's still fair to say that the demand continues to be higher than pre-pandemic. And that is mainly because hybrid working has also more subtle and long-term impacts, which are sometimes less than easy to strictly separate from the changes related to the pandemic itself. Lifestyle changes, just spending more time at home and organizing time differently, works in favor of products such as high-end espresso coffee machines and small cooking appliances, as consumers are cooking at home more often but don't necessarily want to spend more time cooking. So they appreciate the convenience of using products such as multi-cookers or light fryers. The same could be said about house chores. Working partially from home often means tidying and cleaning more frequently, but at the same time, we see consumers trying to limit the time spent on such mundane activities and investing in high-end vacuums or robotic vacuum cleaners. Okay, so is it fair to say that consumer appliances and electronics will keep benefiting from these lifestyle changes? Um, Yeah, absolutely. Even though consumers will only buy a new coffee machine or monitor every so often, one aspect of flexible, flexible working aiding these industries in years to come is the replacement element. Many products are being used more now when consumers are at home. We saw kettles frequently, open our fridges more often, make coffee several times a day, and keep our monitors switched on throughout the day. It both shortens products' lifespan and adds to what we demand from these products in terms of design, quality, or practicality of use. Of course, we can currently see a stabilization of demand as consumers bought such products quite recently and don't need to replace them, especially in our current economic climate. But at the same time, uh, with hybrid working imposed by the pandemic at first, these products changed almost overnight from considered non-essential to staple household products. Interesting. So anything else we didn't cover? Maybe one last thing that we haven't mentioned yet is the entertainment aspect of many products among electronics. Consumers export or rediscovered the ways they can use technology for home entertainment during the pandemic, whether it's gaming or starting a home cinema. But what is interesting is that the normalization of this form of entertainment at home is still having an effect. Yes, of course, many of us really miss traveling and activities outside of home, but it seems that we also enjoy having a quiet night in with our headsets, TVs, or gaming consoles. Well, that's a neat transition to Pear, who's been uh, focusing on toys and games. Um, so Pear, have we seen gaming take off during the pandemic? Yeah, we have. So for video games, we saw basically a boost in demand across the board. Uh, consumers used video games as a way to keep in touch and hang out with their friends and families during the 
early pandemic times, but still doing it in a socially distancing way. We saw increased consumption, like Veronica just mentioned, in hometainment categories, which includes video games. And also many games brought forward extra content outside of the games. So for example, we saw Travis Scott and Drake in Fortnite. We saw many traditional sports turning to video games to keep going throughout the early pandemic. And also we saw a higher engagement in streaming, which in turn leads to more interest in video games. But also after the first lockdowns, we've seen a boosted demand that has led to more consumers discovering gaming. We also saw that gaming was used as a kind of a stress reliever and a sort of escapism. This can be seen by many games during the pandemic that were successful, that were positioned sort of as a casual, non-strict activity, with Animal Crossing being a prime example. And what about the more traditional toys aimed at children? So for traditional toys, we saw mainly activity-based toys, such as arts and craft, construction, games and puzzles, outdoors and sports toys increase. This was mainly because kids were at home more, parents needed to keep them occupied, while these activities also meant that the whole family could participate and do something together. We also saw scientific and educational toys increase. This was because more homeschooling led to parents weren't really sure how to engage with their kids in an educational way, so they turned to these toys for help. And another key trend in traditional toys is the rise of kiddles. So as people are spending more time at home, they're spending less money while simultaneously being bored, especially during the early lockdowns. And with a higher disposable incomes, adults are spending more money on toys and video games for themselves. And the key factor is this, in this is nostalgia, where they are buying toys from their youth. And we have seen this with Pokemon cards, which has benefited greatly from this. And the Kittle trend is expected to stay in the forecast years as well. Okay, so going from entertainment products to staples used regularly, how did hybrid working affect the tissue and hygiene industry, another industry you've been focusing on? So yeah, with hybrid work, people were staying home more than before, and this led to an increased consumption for tissue products such as toilet paper and paper towels. It also led to an elevated demand level as a result of the hygiene aspect of the virus. This has died down a bit since 2020, but still plays a bigger part in consumers' lives compared to pre-pandemic. And one category that we saw really benefited from this was wipes. Right, so were there, was there any categories that didn't see the same positive impact over the last two years? Yeah, there, there was not growth across the board. We saw products that were connected to socializing being negatively affected in 2020 and 2021, such as uh, pocket handkerchiefs that are mainly used on the go, facial cleansing wipes and also deodorant wipes. So with people spending more time at home, they don't go to the office, which leads to less social interactions and situations where those products are needed. The expectation for these negatively affected categories is to recover by around 2023 to be on a similar level to 2019. And for tissue products, we're expecting them to keep growing and per capita consumption to increase as hybrid working will play a bigger role in consumers' lives in the future. Thank you, Per. And now let's bring in Miles, who will tell us more about another industry whose fortune was completely reshaped by the changes brought about by the pandemic, home improvement and gardening. So, Miles, was it a drastic change? Yeah, so I don't, I don't think it would be any kind of an exaggeration to say that the global increase in hybrid working has been one of the most significant trends to impact the home and garden industry overall positively in the past few decades. It's not that the industry hasn't experienced a wave of trends and lots of dynamism. It's just that for the most part, much of these trends have been more to the negative side than anything else. So, So what was the picture like before the pandemic? So, okay, if we look back on the two decades prior to the pandemic, much of the expectations for any kind of uh, dynamic or uh, strong growth that would really um, uh, move the needle in terms of value sales for home and garden largely was coming from developed markets. So particularly Asia Pacific. These were the markets where uh, sales of products like paint and, and sofas and the rest of that we were seeing strong, really aggressive, intense growth. Compare that 
to the Western world, so Western Europe, North America, and much of these markets had settled into a much more kind of muted, slow growth, a bit of stagnation, lots of categories. Of course, a few uh, specific examples uh, come up as exceptions, but generally speaking, much of those categories, especially home improvement and gardening, had settled into a really small, slow growth kind of trend. So that came from a range of reasons, including just kind of overall industry saturation. But a large driver of all of that was really how those industries were selling to younger consumers. And like particularly the the the, the failure of products, um, industries like um, home improvement and gardening to, to attract a younger consumer group. So that's sort of um, like a millennial Gen Z cohort. For the most part, those consumers had shown far less active interest in acquiring home improvement, home decor, home design skills than their parents had at any point previously. But more importantly, many of those consumers, particularly in developed markets, so an increasingly urbanized uh, set of consumers, we were spending far more of their working lives in rented accommodation, often pre-furnished, where they didn't have anywhere near the same opportunities or flexibility uh, to buy new furniture, paint walls, um, get involved in any kind of serious home decor or renovation products. Totally different to a previous generation where that would absolutely be the case. So prior to the pandemic, the death of the uh, do it for yourself trend and the move towards do it for me, kind of uh, bringing in uh, contractors to uh, take on more projects wherever possible and home improvement and gardening kind of moving into this uh, purely hobby recreational niche was the overall picture of the industry. But if we now cut ahead to 2020, home seclusion, so of course, <laughs> Um, so, of course, hybrid working coming out of that had a major impact on industry sales. So home office furniture was the first category to really benefit from that dynamic. So sales of home office furniture uh, rose significantly to some of the highest levels in most markets ever. But that that dynamic of home seclusion had an overall impact on raising the value of the home to the consumer in general, in general terms. And so a range of other products saw a significant increase in either sales in 2020 or underlying demand that then showed up afterwards. It was this dynamic where because consumers were spending more time at home, in addition to the need to convert their spaces into uh, gyms or areas to study or offices, just by spending more time at home, consumers experienced or were closer to a range of faults that if they were in their normal schedules, going out, socializing, going to work, might not have been as important. So a wall that needed to be repainted, a bed frame that wasn't doing as well, a sofa that didn't fit in to the general aesthetic as well. The overall home became more important to consumers' lives. The way it worked in terms of function, the way it looked in terms of form was just more important to consumers. And combine this with the expectation that after the pandemic, long after all restrictions are eased globally, we have strong expectations that in most markets, the vast majority of markets, in fact, consumers are going to spend some more time at home, probably working, as is the main driver of that, but also some more time entertaining, some more time using the home. So overall, the underlying demand for a um, more, more functional, aesthetically pleasing home has been a major driver of sales, particularly among younger consumers. So a huge amount of the growth that came in 2020 and later on in 2021 for home and garden was as a result of consumption by millennials, a major factor for the industry. But Throughout this entire time, home and garden has seen a range of major macro factors stop the industry from actually being able to fulfill all of this demand. So first in 2020, store closures, especially for categories like homewares and home furnishings, prevented players from being able to sell nearly as many of the uh, major big ticket items consumers wanted. Then in 2021, as those restrictions were eased, supply chain problems that had started the year prior and then continued throughout 2021 stopped many manufacturers from being able to uh, meet demand. But into 2022, 
Home and Garden had the benefit of actually, because of this huge increase in demand, uh, of being able to pass on quite a lot of the uh, price increases that were uh, dragging down sales in a range of other markets because of these um, inflationary pressures we spoke about earlier. Home and Garden had been able to pass lots of those increases onto consumers just fine because of the increase in demand. But now the industry has far more of a negative um, ex expectation for the future. There's much more concern about the impact of uh, a global recession and then the impact on consumer discretionary spending. And so in my opinion, the industry has just not quite been able to ever get its real time in the sun to enjoy the new trends that are now working in its favor. Thank you, Miles, for the store analysis. And uh, thank you all for coming on the podcast today. And thank you for listening to this podcast. If you'd like to access more content, make sure to visit yourmoto.com backslash insights. 